Just weeks to go now to the beginning of the Summer Olympics in Japan. The organizers insist the games will be held, but much of Japan is still in a COVID emergency. The first international athletes have already arrived. That's right, the athletes are arriving in Tokyo and Japan is pushing ahead with the Olympics next month, even though we're in the midst of a pandemic. Now, the Japanese government says they can handle it, but a lot of people are worried. For example, they're worried about the athletes and their support crews possibly bringing new variants to Japan. And they're worried about people getting together there and creating a so-called Olympic variant and spreading that around the world. Is holding the games really worth it at a time like this? Well, whatever your opinion, it appears it's too late to stop it now. In a world before the pandemic, this promotional video looking forward to the 2020 Olympics was exciting and enticing. But now it's just really, really out of date. No international fans can come to Tokyo to see the Olympics. Only people directly involved in the Games are permitted to enter Japan. Athletes and their support teams, journalists and officials, altogether around 90,000 people. Compare that to the million plus who went to Rio in 2016. But 90,000, that's still a big worry for many here. More than 80% of Japanese people want to see the Games either cancelled or postponed again. Perhaps they have a right to be worried. Only about 3% of Japanese people are fully vaccinated and new variants of the coronavirus are regularly being discovered. In fact, some experts predict the Games could end up producing a new Olympic variant. Tokyo Olympic Cup to yobarete kono saki 100 nen ni watatte jinrui no oki na gukou de atta to hinan sareru koto ni naru de shou. Yet the Japanese government, which postponed the Games in 2020, is determined to hold them next month and are adamant they're taking the necessary precautions with their guidelines, including testing the teams before they travel to Japan, limiting their movements to within the Olympic Village, and limiting the number of fans to just 5,000 people or 50% of the stadium's capacity, whichever is lower. And fans will have to wear masks and only clap their support. Cheering is strictly forbidden. In addition to all of that, the IOC chief, Thomas Bach, believes that more than 80% of residents of the Olympic Village will be vaccinated ahead of the Games set to begin on July the 23rd. But despite all of these precautions, the IOC and organizers require athletes to sign a waiver just in case they do catch the virus. An acknowledgement perhaps that we live in uncertain times and it's hard to predict the future. Okay, let's bring in our guest now. And in Tokyo, we have Shinsuke Kobayashi, a journalist with Japan's leading news outlet, Kyoto News. We also have the International Olympic Committee's first ever marketing and broadcast director, Michael Payne, and Dr. Annie Sparrow, who is a global health expert who's helped manage epidemics all over the world, from the Congo to Syria. Welcome, all of you, to the program. Uh, we might as well go straight to Tokyo and Shinsuke. Shinsuke, we're only a few weeks away now. I know that uh, there's been much apprehension in Japan uh, with just a, a tiny proportion of, the, of society uh, fully vaccinated. But now the athletes are arriving. Has, have that has that uh, apprehension melted away somewhat? Uh, still, still people are rather negative about hosting the Olympics in the pandemic. Uh, I think uh, more than half the population is sort of uh, um, uh, opposing to, to uh, having the games this summer. Uh, but it's gradually changing as the situation, COVID-19 situation is gradually improving. And uh, the first uh, international athlete at, uh, participating in the, in the games, uh, arriving in Japan, 
um, on the 1st of June, which was the Australian softball team. And uh, we saw these uh, young ladies are smiling and, uh, you know, arriving at the airport. And, and I think the sentiment has, you know, changed a little bit since. So, you know, from, uh, yeah. You know, for people watching from around the world, some of them in, in their countries, they have 75% uh, of the adult population fully vaccinated now. And Japan, unfortunately, is only at around 3% of the population fully vaccinated. So it's kind of understandable that people would be apprehensive. We have a very slow uh, vaccination um, process. And why is it, it, is why is it going so slow in Japan, which is obviously well known for being efficient and high tech society? I think the government didn't start the vaccination strategy early enough. Uh, of course, we didn't uh, invent the vaccine. Um, we have to rely on the foreign vaccines. And uh, also, I think. Um, this is my guess, but uh, back in the mind, uh, people kind of had doubt in the in the creation of the vaccine by the time of the games. Uh, we didn't expect the vaccine to be to be uh, invented uh, so quickly and yeah. uh, spread so quickly around the world. Uh, Shinsuke, we heard earlier in our report from uh, the chairman of Japan Doctors Union. Um, he was saying that the world may you know, yet regret holding these games. Um, just want to hear another soundbite from him. Uh, here he is complaining that people just uh, are failing really to listen to sense. え、独裁者のような振る舞いをする一部の人は、え、オリンピック uh, Shinsuke, who is he referring to there? Who has been acting like dictators? Well, I'm not quite aware of this comment, uh, but in general, uh, the, the medical experts and the scientists are, are quite uh, prudent and cautious about uh, having the games. Of course, there will be an impact of the people moving around. If we have spectators, you know, domestic spectators in the stadium, there will be a movement and there will be, will be a chance of uh, another spread of the uh, the virus. So um, I'm not quite sure what this yeah. dictatorship thing, but let me, uh, yes. Let, let me take that question sort of over to Michael. Um, Michael, I mean, outsiders will be looking at this and they'll say, well, of course, the IOC and the Japanese organizers are under a great deal of pressure to just get on with it. You know, it's been delayed already. There's a lot of money invested in this, a lot of reputation invested in this. Can you explain the different pressures on those two different entities? Uh, you're absolutely right. There's no question there's a lot of uh, pressure to try and proceed with the Olympic Games after the one-year postponement. But I think if you look at what the Japanese organizing committee, what the Japanese government and the International Olympic Committee have done, is put in place a set of controls and measures to really ensure that there is a, uh, a safe uh, games. The, the, the measures are unbelievably tough in terms of the testing before you go to Japan, the testing when you get into Japan. And I think there's been a failure in communications uh, to really understand how tough these measures are. Uh, there's no problem. I mean, in Japan at the moment, baseball events have got spectators. There's no problem with that. Uh, they have decided not to let international spectators into Japan. That's disappointing, but understandable. But thereafter, you can only enter Japan as an official or a member of the media if you have a vaccine certificate. Athletes are the only ones exempted on that, and they are encouraged to get the vaccine, but it's not mandatory. You have to do two tests before you can get on the plane. To and Japan. you know this very well because you're going yourself. I'm going myself. I got my second vaccine and certificate uh, last week. You're not allowed to go if you've not been vaccinated. You're not allowed to go if you and don't yet, have two tests. And yet, Annie Sparrow, I know you've referred to all these uh, precautions and measures as cheap gestures. Um, and, and why is that? Well, basically because they're not informed by rigorous science. I mean, the measures that are promoted in the most recent version of the playbook that the IOC has put forward as its protocols protect athletes and the public are in no way sufficient to do just that. There is 
um, you know, it's as if there was a failure to even recognize that the virus is aerosol, airborne, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, the things that we know work, whether it is testing athletes, not just before they come, but most importantly, every single day and often twice a day. We know from uh, you know, re the return to play of sports such as the NFL, the NBA, the women's basketball, which I've personally been involved in, the rugby, these sports require rigorous testing, not just of athletes, but of the support staff, of the hotel staff, of the transport staff. And we know too that opening a window every half an hour is in no way sufficient ventilation, especially not in Tokyo, where it's going to be pretty damn hot. And then there's no measures in place to protect the field of play. Now, if you have excellent measures beforehand that are set up in terms of how you live, how you travel, how you go back and forth between village and venue, for example, so that you're having athletes in single rooms instead of packed in, packed in twice or three per room, then, then the measures on the field of play are less important. However, here, you know, instead of creating a bubble that um, you know, as per other situations, which some of which even despite rigorous uh, bubbles and biospheres such as the India Premier League have failed, you know, it's more like a tent. And so, you know, then we get to the field of play and their events, well, synchronized swimming, that's uh, one, you know, COVID is less likely to survive in the swimming pool, of course, but still it can survive in locker rooms and in the air around it. But what thing about wrestling? I mean, that's about as intimate as intercourse. I mean, what are these measures that are in place then to protect athletes on the field of play, where they can't wear masks, you know, where is the ventilation indoors versus outdoors? I mean, the IOC is still promoting like athletes to stay two meters away from other athletes and one meter away from other people. That's got really nothing to do with how the virus travels and the and the relative risk. So this is where we feel that um, you know we are totally in support of the Olympics going in ahead, but we feel that there is a lot that can still be done in order to make them a lot safer. And and Annie. What is the worst that might happen uh, if things do go wrong, if the measures aren't uh, you know, strict enough? The worst that can be happen is that the Olympics themselves like scrape through. I mean, this is where the IOC has sort of set itself up where, you know, I mean, we're trying to say you can have your cake and eat it too. You know, we understand. We all want the Olympics to happen. The Olympics might themselves happen. There are, you know, there are um, scores of different sports and a few hundred different events. So even if a few of those are cancelled, most of them are likely to proceed. That's great. But we know that there will be a surge in infections afterwards. We've seen this before, whether it's Thanksgiving, whether it's Christmas, we can all picture that global surge of infections. And as we see now, marching across the UK with the Delta variant, which has vaccine escape and demonstrates that, you know, or the South African variant, um, which is going to be dominant across Africa by the time of the Games, and there's another virus which shows vaccine escape, we may well have an Olympic of the variants. So what we, you know, the worst case scenario is, is not even, you know, what happens in Tokyo, but what happens to the world? Mm. And then, and then what happens to the Paralympics, which are precisely one month after the Olympics. And the Paralympics are a group of athletes that are much more vulnerable, and they're going to happen right bang smack in the middle of that predictable surge of infections. So you're saying that uh, the Olympics may happen and then the Paralympics may start and, and end up sort of inheriting uh, whatever the Olympics leaves behind. Michael, you started the program very reassured. I understand that. I know you're double vaccinated and so on. But had, had the International Olympic Committee and the organizers uh, taken the Paralympics into account? Uh, absolutely. The, the, the IOC and the IPC are in lockstep. Uh, the president of the IPC, Andrew Parsons, he joins all of the board meetings and discussions uh, with the Tokyo government and the Japanese organizers. Um, listen, to be clear, the situation is far from simple. And I think the, the IOC and the organizers are continuing to see how they can improve the controls and protocols. But you are going to be tested every day on the ground. You're going to be tested for your temperature at every 50 meters. You will not be able to move. You're not allowed to go downtown. So the measures that are in place are far, far stricter than have been seen for any other sports event. And let's not forget, uh, maybe it's not quite the same, but the world's health officials and doctors were calling for the cancellation of the Rio Olympic Games because of the Zika crisis. Uh, you know, this, the, every single Olympic Games has repeated calls for 
cancellation because it's not safe, it's not the politics. And clear, this situation you know, we're, we're facing is by far the most challenging the Olympics has faced in 125 years. Annie, but still I think not, that, uh, not convinced. I'm still on. Can I just respond briefly? First of all, the Zika outbreak in 2016 was very modest by comparison. But the doctors still called for the outbreak. cancellation. And as we know, we all agreed, you know, we all want the Olympics to go ahead, but there are so many deficits in the current measures to protect athletes, protect Japanese public health. For example, we know that not all athletes can be vaccinated. And nor should it be mandatory, nor should they be forced to sign waivers unless the measures are put in place so that there is daily testing. Testing for temperature is a rubbish measure. We all know that that is an optical, that's just theatre, because the virus is contagious a minimum of two to three days before you get a fever. If you get a fever, 40 to 50 percent of it is asymptomatic. Furthermore, athletes are young, fit, healthy and mobile. They're the most likely to actually pick up variants. And the variants will mix in the village, just as athletes will. And it's a myth, of course, to think that, OK, if you're going to forbid athletes from going out beyond the village, they're going to congregate within the village, within their hotel rooms. Of course they are. They are under tremendous pressure. And, you know, and, and therefore, what we're going to see with variants is that they're going to mix and that then athletes will then export them back to all of the other countries of origin. Um, it's OK. Obviously, the, the games, it was hoped... Uh, would do Japan a, a great deal of reputational uh, good, and, and it has the, the potential to do that. But as the doctor, the, the chair of the Japan Doctors' Union mentioned, it also has the potential to really leave a stain on Japan's reputation if something goes wrong. Um, do, you, do you think, all in all, uh, Shinsuke, that this is a gamble worth taking? Because it's a matter of people's lives, uh, I think I think we should never gamble on these, you know, kind of things. But uh, the problem is that, that nobody knows for sure what will happen and uh, what the chances of uh, things going to be a turmoil. And uh, so uh, we have to rely on the experts, and uh, and the decisions should come from the you know, either government or the management. Who were responsible of uh, doing it? Yeah. And uh, the problem is, I think, I think uh, the the sentiment in Japan is uh, we, the people are negative because we don't hear uh, any clear explanation of how we tackle the issue and uh, why we have to um, make effort uh, to host the game. What mm. what's the value of hosting the games? Uh, such things uh, not really well explained and uh, I think that is kind of keep people in the dark shadow or the cloud. Yeah. Uh, Michael, this is your 20th uh, Olympic Games winter and summer. Um, obviously, you're not that old. And, uh, but I, 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 I know you described what the, the Games meant to Japan the first time round. Um, perhaps you could just uh, outlay the context for us. Well, it's, it's a great point. The 64 Olympics were incredibly successful, a defining moment, I think, in Japan's sort of modern history, uh, when Japan stepped out onto the world stage and presented brand Japan, presented the innovation, the technology, the culture uh, of what the country represents. But interestingly, in the build-up to those games, the Japanese people were very unsure whether it was a good idea to have the Olympic Games. Uh, they questioned whether they were ready, whether they would be embarrassed on the world stage, uh, that maybe they were trying to do too much too soon. And yet the Games went on to be a tremendous success. And I think uh, these Games ultimately will be defined and remembered by the great sports competition, uh, the great athletic performances, which is how every Games is remembered, uh, and not the build-up. Obviously, that is dependent on making sure that the Games are delivered in a safe and secure environment and that there isn't a COVID legacy coming out from it. But you know, when you've already got sporting events taking place in Japan, the baseball events and others, 
Um, the decision is yet to be taken as to whether mm. Japan will allow local spectators in the stadium. They're, they're understandably waiting to take that decision until the last moment. Um, I think, I, I think, I hope, I believe that in three months' time, in September, everybody will be able to look back and say they were great Olympic Games and that the legacy is a sporting legacy, not a health uh, COVID legacy. Annie, we're coming towards the end of the show. Just a final question for you. Um, obviously, when it comes to a situation like this, people are inclined to listen to the scientists and to medical people. Uh, but as we've heard, there is the possibility that perhaps you're erring on the side of caution too much, perhaps even being alarmist, not you in particular, but the, the medical and scientific community, um, and that it's just possible that Japan can pull this off and in a few months' time they'll look back and say, well, that was a successful Games, uh, nobody was hurt in the making of them, and uh, it's a good thing that, that life somewhat got back to normal. I don't believe that I or any of my colleagues have been alarmist. As a critical care intensivist and someone who has worked in outbreaks around the world, I myself have been involved in this outbreak since the very early days of, of Japan of January last year. And I feel like a Cassandra, frankly, but we know that when you put the, the best measures in place, they can still fail. We have had great successes in return to play and we have created bubbles successfully. As I've said, you know, the, what, is, what we're looking at now is not a bubble, it's a tent. And there are all these ways for the virus to get through. We do know that there are some great things that can be done in order to make the games safe and successful as possible. And those include not just vaccinating athletes, but for example, vaccinating all the workers, all the officials, all the volunteers and support staff that are in Japan now. And that would create a human shield, not just around the Olympic athletes, but around the Paralympic athletes who are a lot more vulnerable. We know that calling in the experts, the players representatives, the players themselves, the players associations would be a lot more successful at communicating the risks, what's in the playbook, the measures and improving compliance, because we all trust those that represent us. But and that's about all the expertise I mean, that's been left out till now. Presumably Japan, the organisers and the IOC would have consulted epidemiologists, virologists and other scientists, medical experts? I don't think the IOC has really thought this through on a way that um, we would have done. or had, I mean, we would have all been brought in a lot sooner. And that's what the IOC is doing now, which is great. But we have like six weeks left and yeah. we have to get our global act together now. You know, for, for Zika in 2016, the WHO convened the emergency committee, asked the com advice of the emergency committee, which is part of the international health regulations, to help us have safe events. I think Michael wants to make a point. Michael? Um, no, I, I just that the, the IOC has been speaking to the WHO nonstop now for more than 15 months. So I, I don't think it's a last minute scramble. I think they've been endeavoring to reach out to get the best advice, the best expertise. You know, it was the IOC that pushed for the postponement. The Japanese organizing committee last year didn't want to postpone. They wanted to wait and see how things would play out. And it was the IOC, Thomas Bach, who went directly to Prime Minister Abe and said, look, this is not going to work. We have to postpone. And those, you know, the decision I, then I, was I, taken, I, the instruction to the organizing committee was given. Yeah. We're postponing. Sorry, Annie, you're talking over Michael. We, we couldn't I hear what you much. said. No, that's OK. Just come in. I was just pointing out that the IOC only cancelled the boxing tournaments, which were due to be held in Wuhan in very early February last year, on the day of the lockdown, January 22nd last year. And when those events were rescheduled in, in Britain, as you know very well, in March of last year, seven boxers and coaches were rapidly infected and the tournaments were shut down within three days. And so this is why I say, um, you know, the... You know, WHO is far more familiar with mass gatherings and the spectators than the actual return to play, and that involves consulting the, the experts and the players' associations. And the IOC, very frankly, has not consulted with the players' associations, the representatives. And, and some of those representatives are, like, at basketball. Annie, they are very well Annie, represented. The, 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 the IOC has been having regular weekly calls with all countries all 200 countries, with all athletes' commissions. They're doing the conferences where you've got 5,000 athletes who will be competing in Tokyo. I, I, you know, there may be areas where one can be critical of, 
in terms of the process here. And I would agree with you back to the uh, the sudden move on the uh, the qualifying events last year, uh, where everybody was getting caught, you know, as, as things were moving so quickly. But as it would relate to the games, I really don't think they could have done more in reaching out and speaking to everybody, communicating with everybody, making sure that they understand the playbooks, getting the feedback as to what should go in there. And it's not and just afraid. the IOC. On that point, Michael Payne, thank you so much. Annie Sparrow, I know you have a retort ready, but we don't have time for it, I'm afraid. And Shinsiki, thank you so much, all three of you, uh, for your contributions to the Nexus today. And we'll see what happens in the games in a few weeks' time. Thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, you can see this program or any of our previous episodes on our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week, then, goodbye. <laughs>